Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. In today's webinar, Shannon Wimp Schmidt will share practical ways that parishes can work towards racial justice in their community. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Parish and Curriculum Marketing Specialist at Ave Maria Press. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions can be sent to the speaker um, or the presenter using this box here, and I will read as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation today. The webinar is being recorded, and I will send you an email tomorrow with the link to the recording. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today. Shannon Wimp Schmidt is co host of the Plaid Skirts and Basic Black uh, podcast and a founding member of the board of directors of Catholics United for Black Lives. She earned a bachelor's degree in theology and Italian from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree in pastoral studies from Catholic Theological Union. Shannon has more than a decade of experience in youth and pastoral ministry and has served in various capacities, including director of RCIA, adult faith formation coordinator, diversity educator, interfaith ministry leader, and theology teacher. Her work has been featured on Catholic TV's This is the Day and in the Catholic Moment and Common Horizon. Shannon, thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Erin. It sounds so nice to have my resume read to me. I'm like, oh, look at me. <laughs> look how accomplished I am. <laughs> you have a lot of experience, and we're certainly glad that you're here to share that with us today. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to get started um, talking about this idea of prophet prophetic welcome, excuse me, um, and specifically how that translates into parish life. But before we start, I wanted to do an opening prayer because, of course, we are gathered here for Christ and with Christ. And so you can find this prayer. This is the USCCB Prayer to End Racism. It's part of a document we're going to talk about in a minute called Open Wide Our Hearts, which is their letter um, on racism uh, from 2018, but they also have these as like prayer cards as well on the USCCB website. So let's take a moment to acknowledge God's presence among us. We'll begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mary, friend and mother to all, through your Son, God has found a way to unite himself to every human being, called to be one people, sisters and brothers to each other. We ask for your help in calling on your son, seeking forgiveness for the times when we have failed to love and respect one another. We ask for your help in obtaining from your son the grace we need to overcome the evil of racism and to build a just society. We ask for your help in following your son so that prejudice and animosity will no longer infect our minds or hearts, but we will be replaced with a love that respects the dignity of each person. Mother of the Church, the Spirit of your Son, Jesus, warms our hearts. Pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Aaron gave me that wonderful welcome, and I appreciate that so much. Um, but I also wanted to just share a couple things about me. Um, I'm a mom. I'm a full-time pastoral minister, mom of four, and married to my husband now for 13 years, which is hard to believe. I'm also a biracial woman. My dad is black. My mom is Irish and German-American. And um, I'm going to be speaking today from that experience, not only my professional experience, but also my experience as a person of color, um, and focusing more specifically on the African-American experience, um, but hopefully giving you ideas that would translate to other cultures. So we're going to try and glean some truths from these ideas and apply them you know, wherever you may be in your parish setting. So first and foremost... I want to give us a background. Why is this work important in parishes? Why do we need to do it? Um, and we can turn as Catholics to the two places we always turn, to scripture and tradition. And so first, I want to look at the story of the woman at the well. You know, we, we read the story and we see it as a story of conversion and we hear it, um, you know, during Lent and all those things. It's a wonderful story. I want to look at it today specifically from the idea of intercultural encounter. 
You have Jesus, who is a Jewish man encountering the Samaritan woman. Uh, they're different cultures who live in a, in the same place, uh, are interacting regularly, who disagree about religion, who disagree about culture, all of those things. And for those who are scripture scholars out there, you probably know already this story is really kind of set up to tease us as if it's going to be an engagement story. So like Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, these a man and a woman are meeting at a well. Um, but as they're setting us up for this engagement story, like every good gospel story, it sort of twists on its head. You know, the engagement story is not, it doesn't happen, first of all, but also it's this woman who is outside of his culture and religion. That's the opposite of what we see in the Old Testament. Um, and it doesn't end in an engagement, but rather a transformation of life. And so we see this encounter where instead of discussing marriage, instead Jesus discusses with her the deepest and most important matters of religion. And it speaks straight to her heart, but also to the biggest questions that they have between their two cultures. And along with that, the Samaritan woman, outside of his culture, outside of his religion, is the one who receives probably the most privileged revelation that Jesus gives in the Gospels. He tells her that he is the Messiah and what she needs to do to be part of this new life that he's inviting her to. So from this story, we can glean that not only do cultural differences not matter to Jesus, but that cultural encounter is about speaking to the other person in their culture to acknowledge those things that are intention and also that at the end of the day, God is calling everyone to himself. And you see that in this quote that I pulled out for you. This is verse 23 and 24 of John 4. He says, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, and indeed the Father seeks such people to worship him. You know, one of the reasons that we do this in parish work, that we try to um, e extend and um, mirror this prophetic welcome that Jesus gives to the Samaritan woman, is because Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, are always seeking to bring new people into the church, into God's people, and into relationship with him. God wants everyone to be part of his family. And uh, there's that great phrase that uh, we hear all the time, you know, God doesn't have any grandchildren. And is our work as parish ministers, as parish leaders, to set up the ways in which we can continue to extend that prophetic welcome. From tradition, we also have, there's various things that we have, and there's actually a great book that Ave has put out um, called A White Catholic's Guide to Racism and Privilege by Dan Horan, uh, where he actually gathers all, pretty much all of the church's tradition, uh, talks specifically on racism into that book. So if you're looking for a resource of like, where can I find all of this in one place, that's a great book that you can pick up from Ave. Uh, but I wanted to pick out one thing from the USCCB in particular, which is the document Open Wide Our Hearts, which I talked about earlier. It's their um, 2018 letter. It was res in response to all of the things that happened in Charlottesville, Virginia in uh, 2017 and, um, and sort of the protests and things that extended from that. And so the bishops say, this is the start of a paragraph on page 30 if you have the document. The bishops say that the injustice and harm racism causes are an attack on human life. The church in the United States has po spoken out consistently and forcefully against abortion, assisted suicide, euthanasia, the death penalty, and other forms of violence that threaten human life. It is not a secret that these attacks on human life have severely affected people of color who are disproportionately affected by poverty, targeted for abortion, have less access to health care and have the greatest numbers on death row and are most likely to feel pressured to end their lives when facing a serious illness. And here's the line that always sits with me. As bishops, we unequivocally state that racism is a life issue. This is an issue that extends to every part of the human person. And any time that the human person, as Catholics, we believe, 
you know, anytime that the human person is attacked in any way, shape, or form, it is an attack on all of life, right? To build a culture of life, we have to fight against every attack on life, and that includes racism. So for parishes, I think this is really important because organizations like the USCCB, like Catholics United for Black Lives that I'm a part of, and many others, these national organizations can't have the same impact on the local level that we can have in the parishes. It's important for us to do this work not only because we're called to it as Christians, not only because we're called to love another, one another, but also because we can sometimes have the most concrete and swiftest impact on our local communities. So thinking about this on that local level, you know, as a church, we love to think globally and act locally. Um, that principle of subsidiarity, um, subsidiarity, I always say that word wrong, sorry. Um, and uh, to really bring all of these principles down to the local level. And that's what we're doing at the parish. Okay, so now let's get to the practical stuff because that's probably what all of you are here for. You know, all this is well and good, but there are probably some of us here who maybe are wondering, where do I start? What's the first step? There's a lot we could do, how, we, how do we choose? There might be others out there who are already doing this work, but really want to go to the next step. So I put together kind of some easy steps, maybe not easy, but um, simple. We'll go with simple steps that you can take to assess your needs in the parish, to assess the needs in your community. First and foremost, um, I'm a data person. I love a list. I love a spreadsheet. Um, get the data. Get the data on your parish community, on the surrounding community. You know, do your parish demographics match the area, the neighborhood that you're in? Is there a group in your neighborhood that you're not reaching? Are there um, Black and Indigenous or by people in your parish, black and indigenous people of color in your parish, in the surrounding community, are they welcomed, celebrated, listened to, represented in your liturgy, in your ministries? Um, and then, you know, like if your parish population is a lot different from the community, then what are you doing to outreach to the community? You know, one of the things that Canon Law says is that the pastor is in charge of the spiritual needs of everyone in a geographical area. So that includes the people who aren't sitting in our pews. So what are we doing to provide for their physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health as well? Second, I invite you to interrogate your history. You know, are there past hurts? Uh, for example, a community that I was in, the bishop had to choose between uh, two parishes closing. This was in another diocese that I'm in now. And he picked the black church rather than the white church. And, you know, there were a lot of things that went into that. Uh, and, you know, I, I realized that diocesan, you know, assessments are, are much bigger than that. But, right, the visual, the optics, and the, the pain caused to that Black community where this traditionally Black church that had been in this neighborhood for hundreds of years um, now was gone. There were a lot of hurts that had to go around with that. And so ministry in that neighborhood, in that area, had to acknowledge that, had to address that. Um, also looking at historical trends. Uh, do you have a large immigrant population? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, urban parishes maybe looked one way at one time and then with white flight kind of out to the suburbs, now they look a lot different. So just, you know, what is the history? Acknowledge the history and make sure you address it when you're making your plans. Third, look at your leadership. Do your clergy, staff, lay volunteers, et cetera, represent the whole population of your parish? Do you have BIPOC people in leadership, even if they're in a minority group in your parish, even if you only have a small percentage? Um, do Does your leadership have a specific look, have a specific socioeconomic status, whatever that is? Um, and if so, or if not, what needs to be assessed and addressed to sort of meet the needs that you've discovered? And also one big plug I will always put in as someone who is often the only person of color on a, a committee or something, you know, uh, tokenism is certainly real. Uh, putting one black person on a committee or one Hispanic person on a committee 
is not the same as having two or three. You know, um, having more than one voice is very important, and also having you know good representation from a community that we can have lots of input rather than just one person who sort of looks uh, looks the right way on a committee. Um, number four, it's really important, I think, to identify glaring emissions. Uh, are there certain things that need to be addressed immediately or can be addressed immediately with just minor adjustments? If not, that's okay. How can we implement a long-term plan to address those things? Uh, one example I often give to people, you know, we think about something like a parish mission. Uh, you might hire somebody to come in and talk about, you know, the three pillars of Lent, you know, fast, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Um, whereas you, other people might be just bringing in a speaker of color to for Black History Month. Um, I get brought, brought in for Black History Month a lot to talk at parishes. Um, but, you know, if you notice, I have quite a few degrees. I can talk about a lot more than racial justice and Black history. Uh, so bringing in people of color to do that parish mission. Um, or looking at different ways that you can incorporate different cultural expressions into the things that you already do. Number five, find your strengths. What are your parish's gifts and strengths? You know them. You know, some parishes have great liturgy. Some are really great at outreach. Whatever it is, identify those gifts and strengths and leverage them into doing this work. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel or you don't have to imitate the parish down the block. Um, one of the best things I think we can do as church is to see like, what are the needs that we as a, you know, three parishes in this town or as our deanery, our diocese, whatever, how can we meet the needs of the whole people of God without duplicating work? So if your parish is really great at outreach, that doesn't mean you need to start a whole new thing to do something that another parish is doing incorporate racial justice initiatives into what you already do, into your ministry and all of those things. And then sixth, and I think most importantly, is to implement a first priority. Find that first priority initiative and organize your existing ministries around it. Maybe your goal is just to be more welcoming to people of every you know, culture. Great. So how do you do that in your Bible study, in, you know, in the narthex when people are walking into mass? How do you do that in the parish office? How do you do that in the parking lot? All the things that are already there. How do we take this ideal and implement it right now and make that first priority our first initiative that we look to? Um, so those are some ways that we can assess our needs. There are also many resources out there. I made you a huge resource list because there are so many out there that I didn't want to bore you with all of these. You can see that. Um, I think Erin has dropped that into the um, into the webinar for you, so you can grab that. Um, my next suggestion is also to look local. Are there organizations in your area that are doing some of this work already that you can partner with, that you can um, get ideas from? You know, the best people to assess what you need in a local area are the people there. Now, identify those stakeholders, look for the people who are doing this work and who are doing it well and get involved with them. Um, there are also some na national Catholic organizations that can help. I've picked out a few that I really like that are doing work with um, African Americans here. There you can see the various different um, logos here. So you've got the Josephites who are an order of priests who serve uh, the African American community. They have great resources. And the Knights of Peter Claver, which is that blue seal that you see. Uh, Knights of Peter Claver and the Ladies Auxiliary are a fraternal organization for black men and women, a Catholic organization similar to the Knights of Columbus. They have wonderful resources. They are active in all sorts of um, ministries as well as social justice initiatives. They're great. Uh, that tree you see there is the National Black Catholic Congress, which is um, the USCCB's sort of like arm, arm that covers all of black Catholics in America. Um, and they have all sorts of wonderful things. Get on their newsletter. It's, it's just great. I, I get that every month and I'm just always looking through all their stuff. Uh, the Bowman Francis Ministry is a ministry of the Servants of the Divine Word. 
um, and they um, they have uh, that's their outreach to African Americans. They have wonderful stuff too, especially for um, faith formation in particular. Catholics United for Black Lives, which is the organization that I'm a part of. Um, we have national members. Uh, we also have set up with chapters. We have different resources that you can access. Um, also, all of our board does speaking and consulting as well, if you're interested in that. And then finally, Just Faith Ministries. Many of you probably are also uh, aware of them, especially if you're if you're wanting to do those connections between faith and action. Uh, they just have wonderful, the Just Faith program is wonderful as well as their resources. So those are some of the big national organizations. And then finally, look at um, secular organizations. Uh, I think one of the things that sometimes we are too afraid of as Catholics is that like if they're secular, then they won't be perfectly Catholic. Um, many of them have been doing this work much longer than we have. Many of them have already done tons of research and work in racial justice and have good insight into this. As parish leaders, as clergy, um, as religious, we are more than capable of assessing information and resources and conversation with church teaching um, and working with them and using the things that are good and holy and true, you know, without necessarily promoting the things that we would certainly see as, as um, problematic. So just to to not be afraid of that, you know, like you're, you're an adult and a, a smart, wonderful person who God has given a beautiful conscience to, and you can do this work, I promise. All right, so I've talked a lot and I wanted to give you guys three levels of kind of some easy, medium and hard um, effort events that you can do. So here's some, I just picked out three examples of things that I, I think are working really well. So for an easy event, this is from Descartes Charate in Memphis. They're an uh, organization that tries to reduce recidivism in prisons, so trying to keep people out of prisons. Every year they do a taillight repair workshop. So they teach people how to repair the taillights in their cars. Um, and they do that to reduce, you know, being able to do that means you don't have a tail light out, you're less likely to get pulled over by police. Um, and for for black men and women, you know, that reduces one potentially fraught conflict. So it's a really easy thing. You just need to find someone who knows how to repair a tail light, get people out there to show them how, and you're done. If you're looking for a medium level effort, uh, St. Lawrence School in Indianapolis, their parish with a school. At their school, they were noticing that lots of kids were arriving late to school. They have a very diverse population um, of a lot of people who are living in poverty, parents working two to three jobs to paying bills. And so a lot of their kids can only afford maybe one uniform for school. And a lot of them were arri arriving late because they were waiting on school uniforms to clean and dry before they could come to school. And so what they did is they bought a washer and dryer um, for the school that kids could use to wash their uniform at the end of the day. So after, um, at the very end of the day, they allowed kids to change into their spirit wear or gym uniform or whatever. They could wash their uniform in the dryer, take it home clean and ready to go for the next day, and then be at school on time, right? It's a simple thing. It, it takes a little bit of effort because they had to, you know, sort of do the research, buy the um by the washer and dryer and all those things. But it was a simple thing that they could do to help get kids to school on time, be learning, be in place learning, and, and sort of mitigate some of those factors of poverty and, um, you know, that were affecting them. Finally, advanced level. If you really, if you're already doing something, you want to go all in. A great example from Jerusalem Farm, which is a ministry in Kansas City. Uh, they do home repair. Um, as their main ministry, but they set up, they're in urban Kansas City in a very uh, a predominantly black neighborhood, and they live in a food desert. So there's not really a lot of grocery stores, not really, really a lot of places where people have access to fresh produce and all of that. So they did two things. They opened a community garden so everybody could get a plot of land to kind of learn how to grow their own vegetables or whatever and have access to fresh produce. And then along with that, they do a community compost pickup. So people can buy into their service. I think it's like $20 a year or something like that. 
and they get a compost bucket. People can put their, you know, usable waste, food waste, things like that, that can go into compost. They put it in the bucket. People from uh, Jerusalem Farm would come around and pick those up, put them in the truck, and take them to compost the compost pile in the garden. So people from the neighborhood were helping their neighbors in growing their garden, and they also were helping to reduce waste to, um, you know, do some of these environmentally sustainable practices to improve the quality of life in that neighborhood. So that being said, I have talked so much, and I would love to hear some of your questions. So. Erin, I'm going to turn it back over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shannon. I invite anyone who, who's interested or who has a question for Shannon to please type that in the question box now. Um, Thank you so much for walking us through how we can begin or continue working for racial justice in our local parish, um, as well as giving us some specific examples of, of what we can do. Um, I've got a question coming in already here, so I'll just jump Great. right in. Um, you are asked, how do you answer someone who resists anything about Black Lives Matter, right? Hashtag Black right. Lives Matter. Not yeah. the organization. <laughs> but the yep. language to respond about the protests and the lives lost in the black community to bring conversation in a healthy dialogue. Great. So I, I had a feeling this question would come up because um, <laughs> it's a common one. So I appreciate yeah. you bringing that up. Um, so uh, first and foremost, I think uh, I always take a minute to pray because I, I'm an overreactor. That's me. I'm like, ah, <laughs> so I always take a moment to pray um, and try not to overreact. Uh, but I, I think there's two things. Um, one, like we don't win hearts and minds by arguing, right? We're never going to win an argument because um, most people made up their minds. You know, I think I think specifically we speak to the idea of you know separating out the Black Lives Global Network, which is Black Lives Matter Global Network, which is an organization, from the phrase and say, you know, what are we saying? connecting that back to our faith, right? What, where do we find those stories in scripture? Where do we find that in our tradition? How we can do that? Um, and ultimately um, speak to hearts, right? Uh, that, we, that we tell stories. The human brain loves stories. Uh, it really does. Uh, you can get into all the brain research if you want to, but um, you know, the way that we connect with other people is through seeing ourselves through their eyes, you know, to sort of proverbially step into their shoes so that we tell stories. Um, I think in specifically when we're talking about the phrase Black Lives Matter, uh, my first step would be to say, well, what what problem do you have with that phrase, right? To, to listen first, because when people are speaking to us, when they want to share an opinion with us, it's because they don't feel heard. Right. Um, why are people out there, you know, sort of upset about all of the things that are happening in the world? Um, I mean, and we can think of many, right? Since 2020, we have met many, many things that people are upset about. Um, why are they, why do they feel like they need to say it on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever it is? It's because they don't feel heard in their lives, right? So, so listening and then, you know, as we listen to hear what is the underlying story they're trying to tell us and to address that before we get into to sort of the talking points. Um, because I think at this point, especially when, around the idea of Black Lives Matter, like we, we all know the talking points on both sides, quote unquote, both sides, right? Um, and if we're just saying the same things over and over, we're talking over each other and at each other um, rather than listening. And so, um, you know, we have to find a way to sort of break that barrier and to see the other person for what they're really asking. I like that. Yeah. So, so listening. Mm -hmm. You mentioned storytelling. Jesus illustrated that too, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was good at that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, another question here. What do you recommend for white parishes in all white communities? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, first and foremost, I think that one of the best things you can do is to uh, talk about these issues uh, when they relate to what you're already doing. 
um, to also sponsor learning opportunities. So we did um, when Charlottesville ha happened actually. Um, it was it was like my second week of work at my current job. I was having it was a lot. It was a stressful moment, and I work in a predominantly white parish. Um, but I asked my pastor really early. I uh, I think the sec the day after it happened, I said, you know, obviously I have diversity training and all that sort of stuff, and I said, could I do a session on this because I think we need to address it right away. And you know, in his wisdom, he said yes. He was a he's a wonderful man. Um, and so we just talked with the group about uh, the title of the session was how do we talk about race, you know, and, and giving people vocabulary. Um, it was it was pretty basic because that's where our community was. You know, maybe your your community is deeper and they're ready to have a deeper conversation about that. Um, looking at things like maybe in your outreach programs, if you're already, you know, let's say you're donating winter coats every year, you know, take 100 winter coats to a specific site. Um, that's wonderful, but like, what are what are some ways with that site that you can, especially if it's in a community of color, that you can start to incorporate um, justice into that action, not just the charity, but going beyond to justice. And also, what are the ways that you can connect the people who are giving or who are doing the the actual outreach activities with those communities to learn about those communities, to learn from those communities. Uh, to invite those communities into communion with us, right? Sometimes we're like, they're over there and we're serving them. But like, God wants us all to be inviting each other. Like, like let's get everybody in the Catholic Church. Let's do it. I would love that. <laughs> right? Like, mm -hmm. right, invite them in. Um, and then also, uh, you know, doing things like a, a just faith um, where that they're making those connections between the two that we're that we're asking the questions of why and how does scripture how does tradition how does our liturgy speak to these things um there's another great book out there i think this is not an ave book so sorry but <laughs> no no that's okay it's not about um, that <laughs> yeah, yeah. um there's another great book out there i think it's by liturgical training publications they have a book two books on Catholic social teaching and the mass. So where you see the themes of Catholic social teaching in the mass and how you connect to them. Um, that was a great one too. That's not specifically about racial justice, but obviously um, has those wider themes um, that we can start to connect. Hopefully that answers most of the yeah, question. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And there was another question kind of piggybacked on that. Mm -hmm. Are there parish programs to teach about white privilege that you know of? Mm, yes. So, um, I, again, I think I would recommend that book by Dan Horan that Ave publishes called um, A White Catholic's Guide to Racism and Privilege. Um, there, there are a couple of Catholic social teaching ones out there that touch on these. I think um, Ascension Press, I think their new series on um, Catholic social teaching for teens has a ses session on racism, which is pretty good. Um, and uh, we we also have, um, I would recommend looking at like the Claver family, Knights of Peter Claver, National Black Catholic Congress. They have a lot of good webinars um, and they may also have some suggestions as well um, for programming. Uh, unfortunately, and I will say this with love for my church because I love being Catholic, we are very behind in this um, in this work, and there's not a lot of parish programs out there that specifically address the issue of race. We have a lot of great things on poverty, on social justice in general, social Catholic social teaching, um, but we're we're kind of behind. Um, the other one I thought of just now, uh, the National Federation for Catholic Youth Ministry just published. Um, a series on African American Catholics is a video series that they just put out. Um, it's in the handout that I gave you, um, and uh, on their diversity page, they also have some great diversity resources there. Uh, again, not necessarily a parish program, uh, but they'll have things that you can incorporate into your ministry. Great, thank you. I wanted to mention too. I did include the handout um, in the webinar, if and I'll include it in the follow-up email in case 
you didn't get it. Um, I was, I, I, it was very interesting to go through all those different parishes to see what, what is being done and then how you can, you know, adapt that for your own parish. I thought that was excellent. Um, and Dan Haran did a webinar with us in December. And so you can also see that um, recording on our website. And there is a um, small group discussion guide that's a free mm -hmm. PDF that mm -hmm. that's, um, that would be helpful too. Okay, so let me get back to the questions. Um, uh, I, here's from someone. I live in an area that is about equal white and Latino. Mm -hmm. I had a pastor who was insistent that our parish not openly accommodate the Latino population. He mm -hmm. reprimanded the person leading the rosary before Sunday mass for praying one decade in Spanish. We eventually left that parish. Do you have any suggestions for how to implement gentle change mm -hmm. when the pastor is resistant? Um, so first and foremost, I think you, again, go to prayer, pray for your, for your pastor, um, because it, it's a hard job. I see what they do every day. I work in a parish, um, and I would not want to be a pastor. So if there are any pastors out there, you're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> um, and um, the first and foremost, pray for them. I think um, one of the things I always say is that if you are a white person, you have power in the church that people of color don't. So the more that you can advocate, um, especially in in numbers, right, with with a large group of people, say we need to do this, that helps because uh, unfortunately, um, we we do have condition biases uh, in our culture. It's just sort of a cultural thing that we've inherited, um, and you know that voice matters more sometimes, unfortunately. So I think that that like not giving up on it. Um, secondly, um, I would say that that uh, starting with cultural things may be the easiest. Um, finding those connections, especially um, if language is is the barrier. Um, you know, sometimes you have people who do say things like, you know, they they need to learn our language, they need to assimilate. Um, that's not really uh, both borne out in in both our faith pro, um, our faith understanding and in social sciences, that's really not the best way to go about things. But um, that is how some people feel. Um, so I, I would start with some cultural things. Um, you know, what are the things that we already know and love together as Catholics that we can incorporate both into? Uh, so for example, you know, we all love Mary. What are some ways that Mary is celebrated in that specific culture? Um, you know, we often think, uh, when we talk about Latino people, we often think of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And if you have a Mexican population, that's great. But like, remember that there are other, um, you know, other Hispanic groups that maybe have different um, devotions to Mary. Um, uh, you know, what are some ways that they honor the Eucharist in their culture? One of the things that I loved uh, specifically when I worked with Hispanic, um, I lived, I worked in a very diverse parish that had a large Asian, a Korean national parish. Uh, we had a Hispanic pair, um, a mostly Mexican and Latino. Um, we also had a large black population and a large Anglo population. So we were like, we were really um, American in a nutshell. <laughs> it was, it was a, a balance every day. Um, but one of the things that I loved when I worked there and learned from um, our Hispanic families, they did um, on Good Friday, they would take the corpus off of the cross um, and bear, bury it or, or put it in the tomb, quote unquote, in a side chapel. Um, and that, you know, like that's not a, as a Irish American and a, mm -hmm. a black American, that's not something we do, but it was so meaningful to me as something new to experience because it was a way to just sort of really enter into the triduum in a new way. Um, and, you know, as an Irish person, you know, that, that tradition of wrapping, you know, veiling everything on Good Friday of covering the crucifix and covering, you know, everything like that's one thing that we have brought to the American church. So sometimes I think those cultural things can help. Um, one way I've also talked about this in relation to schools and things like that is just like you want when we talk about things like translating documents or whatever, you want people to be able to 
understand what's going on and to participate in the community. So yeah, maybe they don't want to use Spanish in the liturgy, but like, can we get Spanish in uh, the bulletin? Can we get it for the forms for religious ed, those kinds of things where people, you know, I think about, you know, we parents are the primary educators of their children in faith so we need them to be able to fully participate if they don't understand what's going on you know if i showed up to a polish church i i don't speak polish i love polish people but i would have no idea what was going on other than like here's sort of what the liturgy looks like you know mm -hmm. um and i'm not as able to teach my kids and those kinds of things and so we're going to pass on the faith we need to give parents all the tools we can mm -hmm. in some other way I'll go talk for hours, so I'm going to stop answering the question. <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it. Uh, another question. It seems some hide, hide behind the phrase, all lives matter. But in reality, that seems to hint of denial of black lives. Your thoughts on this? Um, I would certainly agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. That's my personal opinion. Um, you know, I think that comes from a place of um, of really trying to be fair to others most of the time, right? To say like, well, yeah, but you know, like, of course, like, Black Lives Matter, every, every life matters. That's why we care about, you know, lives in the womb and euthanasia and all of those things. But to go back to you know, what that quote I took out from the Bishop's document, right? Um, every attack on life is, it, you know, eats away at the, the fabric of, of a culture of life. Um, it, when it comes to the phrase Black Lives Matter, one of the, th the reasons I say it over and over again, if you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, um, you'll see this all the time. About, about once every three months, I just decide I'm going to post the Black Lives Matter. That's just what I'm going to do. That's how I, that's, that's me. Um, just because I, you know, everyone needs to know that. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's sort of saying like something along the lines of like, you know, save the rainforest. We're not saying don't save the deciduous forest as well, but the rainforest is the one under attack. You know, um, Black Lives Matter is saying that um, we need to make sure that people pay attention to the gaping wound, right? You can't, you can't treat, um, you know, you got to do triage when you're a doctor, you, you start with the most important um, issues. And for us as African Americans, um, we have not for over 400 years been treated as if our lives matter to our nation, unfortunately. Um, and that's improved. I'm not saying, you know, obviously so much has improved uh, in, in regards to racism in our country. Um, but when you have something like what just happened with Amir Locke, um, you know, a 22 year old kid who was sleeping in his bed, a licensed gun over who was trying to assess a threat and didn't even have time to identify the police before he was shot to death. Um, that is a problem that needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed for black people, for Latino, for Asian, for white people. Um, but one of the things that we talk about, especially, um, you know, and we're in civil rights work for, for black people is that, you know, the original sin of, of our nation, quote unquote, is, um, is slavery, is anti-black racism. And if we want to solve all the other things, we have to go to the heart of it, right? What do we do as Catholics with original sin? we baptize you as a baby. So we get rid of it, right? You start with a clean slate. We have to get rid of it first before we can, um, because if we do that, then everyone benefits, right? If we start implementing police procedures that um, address the way that biases play into policing for black people, that's going to benefit uh, Latino people, Asian people, white people, right? Because we're training ourselves to assess our biases before we act. Um, and that can't hurt other people. So I, I think that's uh, hopefully speaking to the question. Um, uh, and of course, you know, every life is sacred. 
Um, but just like when we're we're talking about abortion or euthanasia, we we want to save that one life in front of us um, first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Shannon. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the Catholics United for Black Lives? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, Catholics United for Black Lives, or CUBL, as I'll refer to it, to save myself a mouthful. (laughs) Um, CUBL is uh, now, um, we're an incorporating not-for-profit, so we're still working on our stuff with IRS, but we're a not-for-profit that um, works for the flourishing of Black lives um, from womb to tomb. So we're a consistent life ethic organization. That means that we value, as Catholics, we value life from conception to natural death. Um, And we were founded in October of 2020 in response to the protests um, around George Floyd's murder. Um, And uh, and as a way for us as Catholics, uh, and we are an African-American board, so everyone on the board is of African descent, to to basically address and enter into the Black Lives Matter movement as Catholics while being faithful to the church's teaching on life, on sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because, as I said, as we just sort of talked about in my answer to the last question, these things are too important for us to not be involved in as Catholics. If we step out as a church, not only do we lose our credibility, but we are we are not living up to our baptismal calling. And so especially, you know, understandably, people having a lot of problems with the Black Lives Matter Global Network with some of their positions on different issues, we wanted to um, give Catholics a way to enter into this work and also to, um, excuse me, and also to be able to engage with the wider Black Lives Matter movement, including all of the organizations that are involved in that, um, and bring a Catholic voice to the table because it was missing. Uh, so that was kind of our founding. Uh, right now we run national memberships where people can be involved in our work. We get uh, you get different resources and all of those sorts of things on a monthly basis if you do. Um, if you are a member, we have a couple chapters that are forming right now. Um, either in a diocese or a parish or things like that. So if you're interested in starting a chapter in your parish, we'd be happy to do that for you. Um, and then our board also does uh, speaking, consulting, diversity, um, you know, training, all that sort of stuff. We're all um, diversity educators and, and, and faithful Catholics as well. So uh, that's what we do. We are just one of many. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, you know, if you would like to connect with us, feel free. Our website is cubl.org, and you can follow out. Uh, it's the same, has all our social media and stuff on there as well. Awesome. I'll include that link in the follow-up email too. Yep. Someone has a question here about the title of your webinar. <laughs> i wanting to know how is this prophetic versus evangelization or and catechesis? Sure. Well, um, I mean, prophets evangelize, so there, that's, uh, I don't see a different, too much of a difference between the two. Um, I think that if you look at uh, the, old, the Old and New Testaments, uh, what you see when you see prophets is not only that they proclaim the word of God, but they call the people to justice, they call the people to community, they call the people to repentance, and that they, um, that they do that in a way um, that proclaims the word of God and is faithful to the word of God. Um, You know, you think about someone like Isaiah, who's saying all of you who are wealthy sitting there on your couches while the poor starve, Um, you know, so our welcome isn't just to preach the good news, um, right? Even though that is right. Prophecy is part of that preaching the good news. It's kind of a sub subset of evangelization, but also our welcome is to call everyone, right, to repent, to be just, to be kind and loving, and to live as a community that preaches God's word to the world and acts as leaven, right? We are, we're not, when we build the kingdom of God, we're not just saying, oh, let's build the kingdom of God and, like, help people have a relationship with Jesus and, like, be nice people, Right. If, if we're building the kingdom of God, we're going out there and we're doing prophetic things. We have, you know, people like Servant of God, Dorothy Day, who is out there like 
you know, being accused of being a communist and all of these sort of things, but changing things. You also have people like Jose Maria Escriba, who's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, but who is calling people to radical conversion in every aspect of their lives and the simplicity of living their daily life, right? Uh, the saints, the prophets are out there um, welcoming people by their nearness to Christ, by their openness, by their joy, by their kindness. I think of Pope Francis when I think of somebody like that but also not being afraid to speak truth, not being afraid to, um, to be willing to be vulnerable and to go against um, what's out in the world and maybe what's in our pews as well um, and to challenge those who've got too comfortable. I like myself, I do that. Um, I'm often too comfortable. I'm sitting in a really nice office right now drinking coffee. So. <laughs> <laughs> So what would you say to somebody who is working in a parish and they are trying to live and bring, you know, open wide our hearts to their parish and implementing many of the things that you have, have talked about today or some of the things and they're getting pushback, they're getting mm -hmm. apathy from their congregation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I thought this might also come up. So I wrote down an answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> So as I said, uh, telling stories, right? If if um, this speaks, I think, to that question about being in an all-white parish, you know, bring in people who have experienced these things. Bring in um, Black and Indigenous people of color to tell their stories and share. Um, the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, which is our next diocese over, they did a, a panel where they brought in people from different parishes so that people could hear that. Um, and most most importantly, I, I say it a thousand times, I said pray, but like be be rooted in scripture, be rooted in the sacraments, be rooted in prayer, um, because we have to tend ourselves first when we do this work. Uh, so, so doing that, um, to see Christ in the other person, to see the other person, even when they're apathetic, even when they're angry about it, that the reason they are is coming from a, a place of, of deep caring, right? Like we're hitting a nerve for a reason. Um, so what is that? Um, to, you know, to address their concerns, but also like maybe not get too caught up in the people who are resistant. Um, sometimes the people who need it the most are not the most vocal. You know, we've all, we've worked in parish long enough to know that sometimes the, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, and as much as we love to have big numbers at our events and all of that thing, like our job as ministers is ultimately to speak to each heart, to invite each person to, to Christ. And so even if there's five people of color in your parish and on a, on a sort of like bigger scale, they really don't matter. I can tell you that they probably feel welcomed and loved by you addressing something like racism in a homily or in a program or whatever. I can tell you, I, I rarely, uh, I'm one of the few people of color in my parish, I rarely hear the things that affect me personally um, addressed in a homily or in a, in a program unless I bring them up. And that, like, it's, it's, it's understandable. It's not something that personally affects them. But when I do hear that, man, do I feel seen and loved in a way that I don't normally. Um, and just, you know, I often say thank you. Like, I know I might be the only one, but like, thank you. And I, I have other stories about trauma around that, but I won't share them. Uh -oh. so, so yeah. anyway, we won't share them today. But, yeah. um, and then the other thing I, I will say is also like, be patient. One of the, some of the wisdom of, of my elders um, as an African-American is that like, this is the work of generations. It takes time and things don't um, happen overnight. You know, that it's the work of every generation to move the, the ball forward, so to speak. So what I do today is going to make an impact for the kids who are five, who the kids who aren't even born yet. You know, the reason that I can sit here today with you having a master's degree, having, you know, all of these wonderful privileges and joys, the, the ability to have a weekend, uh, right, um, is because of the work of my ancestors. You know, my ancestors were brought here as slaves. Um, many of them died uh, in slavery beaten and broken um but you know today we have um 
doctors, lawyers, presidents who are black because we each did the work a little bit at every generation. And that includes everyone. That includes the, all of the allies of every other community that have walked on that journey. Mm -hmm. So be patient, don't give up, um, right? And know that at the end of the day, it is it is Christ's work and we're, we're just lucky to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And that, and that he has it in his hands um, mm -hmm. and that he'll, he'll take care of it. Yeah. We are, we are seed planters and not, um, not the, not the master gardener. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And somebody wrote here, thank you for continuing to educate all of us, all of us when it must be exhausting with such <laughs> patience and grace. And I have to concur great patience and grace. Thank you so, so much. Shannon, tell us a little bit about your book that is coming out, available for pre-order, audiobook is available, and it will be available at the end of March in print. Absolutely. Tell um, everybody about it. Absolutely. So our book, uh, Fat Luther Slim Pickens, A Black Catholic Celebration of Faith, Tradition, and Diversity, is a book by myself and my podcast co-host, Marcia Elaine McGee, who I believe will be hosting a later um, webinar yes. later in, in this year. Yep. Um, she is a black Catholic and as well as I am a biracial Catholic. And we talked just about um, our experience and our culture as black Catholics through the lens of the liturgical year. So the first chapter is going to talk about Advent. You're going to learn about how I am terrible at liturgical living. Um, I'm not good. <laughs> you made and, me feel so good. <laughs> and maybe for Mardi Gras last year, I did not get a king cake and I stuck a baby Jesus, which was really just a plastic toy from my kid's playroom into a sheet cake. So <laughs> that's a, um, so that, that's just me. Um, but we talk about that in relation then also uh, in relation to how we live our faith, our culture, our traditions, and sort of the universal lessons that that has for the church, how we can learn as a church to um, have unity and diversity and how that translates into who we are as Americans and how we participate in the public life of our country. So check it out. You can get it on ebook today if you want to. You can start reading it tonight or you can pick up a hard copy in a couple weeks. Hopefully. Yeah, pre-order today <laughs> and um, you can get the 25% off using the code webinar 0208 for today's date. Shannon, I will share many of these positive comments that are coming in um, with you later in the week, but really thank you so much. Your your grace, your how articulate you're being and really sensitive to, to everyone is so appreciated. Um, and we look forward to continuing or maybe beginning to work in the in the vineyard with you to bring the kingdom of God. Anyone um, who wants to come into the work, we're happy. That's <laughs> right. That's Thanks. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And please join us next week. Joel Stepanek from Life Team is going to be talking about Life Teen, sorry, is going to be talking about how we can approach new beginnings in our ministry, those we minister to, and in our lives in general. So join us for that. Thank you, everybody. Have an excellent day. We'll see you next week. Thanks again, Shannon. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>